occasionally on a winter morning, our phone would ring at like 5.45 in the morning. And I knew that meant one thing, that we were having a snow day. And so I was about to get the day off school where all my other friends would have to listen to the... I'm so old, the internet wasn't around yet, all right? That's how old I am. So I, I, I'm ancient. I understand. I understand. So I grew up. I grew up. You couldn't just log online and check it out. You had to listen to like public radio. And then it had to scroll through every closing in Akron and Canton and Cleveland. And, and the worst mornings would be like if every other school around you was called off and your school wasn't called off. Oh, the rage that you would experience. But I never had to endure any of that because I got the, my mom got the phone call. And so when I would hear the phone ring, I'd be like, yes, it's a snow day. I don't have to go into school today. It was a great surprise, and it would change the course of my whole day. Now, instead of having to go to school, I could sit at home in my pajamas, and I could watch reruns of The Wonder Years in Matlock all morning. It was a phenomenal, it was, okay, yeah, I love Matlock. I don't know what's wrong with me, but it was, it was just great that I didn't have to go to class, and it was going to be awesome, all because we got an unexpected message early in the morning that changed the outlook of my whole day. And this morning, we're going to see when Mary was given an unexpected message that changed not just the outlook of a day or a year or even a life. It changed the outlook of the world. And it changed the outlook for every single one of us. And that's what we're going to look at this morning as we, as we keep going in our series called Dreams of Christmas. And if you have your phones or your tablets, you can follow along in Luke chapter 1. If you don't, then the verses are going to be on the screens there as we see the same angel Gabriel who last week delivered a message to Zechariah and Elizabeth, a couple who tried for years to have a kid and they weren't able to and everybody thought they're just unable to have children and the angel came and delivered a message to them that they were going to have a child who would turn out to be John the Baptist that same angel Gabriel now appears to Mary and that's where we pick up the story in Luke chapter 1 starting in verse 26 where we read this in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, let's just, let's just stop right here because we remember what happened last year or last week. We saw the scene last week when Gabriel appeared to Zechariah and he was freaking out because he was in the temple and all of a sudden an angel just appears. And, and if, you, if you're a fan of, of some art like grandma art, if you're a fan of either grandma art or like 20 years ago, the show Touched by an Angel, if you've got kind of that picture of an angel where there's just these real feminine creatures creatures and these little wings and these halos and they're real peaceful or maybe like you've got a kid who's like a baby in a diaper kind of looks like Cupid flying around just slinging arrows at everybody to make them fall in love if, if that's your idea of, of what angels look like then you'd be like why what's the big deal why are you so scared but but angels look a little bit different and we're actually the, the curtains pulled back for us a little bit in in the book of Ezekiel and, and check this out. This is really weird. But in Ezekiel 10, 14, we're told this about, about the angels, that angels, their true nature, they have four faces, that of a cherub, that of an angel, of a human, of a lion, and of an eagle. Now, I don't know what kind of freaky creature that is, but that's how Ezekiel describes angels, all right? We know that cherubs have four wings, and there's another, there's another brand of angels called seraphs, or seraphim, or the plural, and they have six wings with eyes all over their body. So whatever the case is, these things are freaky looking. And they just appear, yeah, you're going to be scared out of your mind as well. And so that's Gabriel, and he shows up, and he appears to Mary out of the blue with some news to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And so here is Mary, 
She's young, she's in love, she's engaged to be married, her whole future is in front of her. Think back if you've ever, if you've ever been married or if you're engaged right now or if you long to be engaged one day, think through what all of that's like. That period where you still don't know each other's flaws entirely because you're, you're transitioning from the dating where like everything's perfect with one another and it's so cute and the little differences that they have from you or tell, they're just things that draw you closer together and everything great. And then you ask, hey, I want to spend the rest of my life with you. And, and they agree. And uh, you then start to plan for the rest of your life. And then you start to discover a couple more of those things that you would do differently. And you're starting to wonder, well, it's not as cute as it used to be, but we're going to be fine. And we're just going to plan to go through life together. And we're going to sit down and we're going to plot out all our dreams and all of our visions. And we're just going to have a great time. And it's that state where you're young and you're in love and the reality of, oh, I'm going to have to die to myself every single day if I want this relationship to work, hasn't sunk in yet. And so you're there and you're everything, everything's great. You've got your whole life, you're planning it. You're planning your whole life in front of you. And everything is about to change in this instant. And we have the privilege of looking back from thousands of years, and we see how the whole story played out. So I want us to try our very best today to put ourselves in Mary's shoes. You're planning. You're in love. You've got dreams. And everything is about to change. How do you respond? Now, you, none of us have had an encounter like Mary has had, and yet some of us in life have encountered things that are pretty similar. Where we're walking through life and things are pretty comfortable, we've got a good grip on things, and we think things are, are projecting one way, and we have job security, and our health hasn't failed, and we're in a successful relationship that brings us a lot of joy, and yeah, we've got issues because every relationship has issues, but we're fighting together, and we're working towards a common goal, and we found, we found a synergy, and everything's going great, and then all of a sudden the news hits. The doctor wants to run another test. The company's decided that it needs to downsize a little bit. Your spouse has developed feelings for another. And everything is about to change. What do we do? What do we do when we find ourselves in those situations? How do we handle it? Because for Mary and for Joseph, their lives were about to be turned upside down. And we have the privilege of looking back and seeing how it all unfolds. But in the instant, they didn't have that privilege. And Gabriel came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. Now, if an angel appears to you, which I highly doubt, but if an angel appears to you and you get over that initial stage of being freaked out and the first things out of the angel's mouth are, hey, what's up? God's pleased with you. You're off to a good start. Like that conversation could go a lot of different ways and it could be a whole lot worse than hearing the, the angel start from a place of God's, God's pleased with you. Like that's the way you want the conversation to start if you're going to have the conversation with the angel. But nevertheless, in spite of the fact that it starts out as well as it possibly could, she is freaked out. She's freaking out. And she's trying to discern what the message means. Now, we are inundated with messaging in our lives. We're inundated with ad campaigns. We're inundated with, with people telling us how they want us to perceive things. We're inundated with different spin on, on different things. We are absolutely inundated with information and in, in just constantly. It's a barrage of information that, that we get every single day. 
And here's Mary who sees an angel. The angel shows up with a positive message for her, and her desire is still to discern what the message means. We must be people who try to discern everything that we hear, even if we trust the source. We have to discern everything we hear, even if we trust the source, especially if we don't trust the source. But even if we trust the source, we need to discern and make sure that the messaging that we are told is actually true, that it is based in truth and not just somebody else's perspective or not just to fit with somebody else's agenda. We need to make sure that the messaging that we hear lines up with what is true. And that's why as people who follow Jesus, we have to be engaged with the heart of God. And that's been revealed to us in Scripture. This is why it is absolutely vital for you, if you want to follow Jesus, that you engage with Scripture. It is the way that God has chosen to communicate with us. It is God's revealed heart to us, and it's available for us. And it has never been more accessible than it is right now. But what can happen when things are readily accessible is we take them for granted. And so I'm challenging you. I know that a lot of people kick off new habits at the start of the new year. And one of the best habits you could start is to make sure that you are principled in engaging Scripture next year. But I'm just challenging you. Why wait? Don't wait until January 1st. Start it today. If you're a user of technology... I cannot, I cannot emphasize enough what a great tool the Bible app is for you. If you go to the app store of whatever device, whether it's an Android device or it's an iOS device, wherever you go, just go in your app store, type in Bible, it's the first one that pops up, and download it. It's absolutely free. If you struggle to understand concepts sometimes, there are translations of the Bible there that are incredibly easy to understand. If you want to go a little bit deeper, there are plans that will take you a little bit deeper. There are a number of great resources available to you where you can go and you can discover the heart of God so that when we're living in a world that inundates us with messages that we're trying to discern, sometimes really good messages and sometimes messages that are completely off base, this is the starting point and we must make sure that we are sitting there and focusing on what is true and what is right and that is the revealed heart of God to us so I cannot emphasize this enough if you're not a technology user then open up your Bible if you do not have a Bible and you do not use technology then come talk to me and we will get you a paper Bible it's your gift from Lakeside absolutely free but we just want you to be engaging with God's heart because this will change you it will change your life it will help you discover the reason you were created it will help you discover what brings God joy, and it will help you become more and more like Jesus. I cannot recommend this enough, and in a, in a society where we're constantly given messaging, we must discern and we must discover that which is true. And so we have to be people who are engaged with Scripture. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And there's Mary with uncertainty because an angel's just shown up. She's trying to figure it all out. And the angel's not mad at her. The angel's not, obviously I'm supernatural. Obviously what I've done is pretty incredible. The angel's not upset. The angel's not sitting there just, just talking down to her saying, well, you should have had more faith, Mary. The angel's walking with her to help her understand. And I know today that that some of you may be at this place where there's so much of, of 
this idea of God that you want to embrace, and there's so much that you want to like, and yet there's just so many questions that you can't get past, and there's just so many things in your mind that just don't completely reconcile, and there's, there's doubt in there, and there's just this, this, this war that goes on in your mind of this desire to believe in God, and yet this thought that, well, if God really existed, then this would make sense, and this would make sense, and this would make sense, and this would make sense. And I just want to tell you a couple things. First of all, never limit the supernatural by your own understanding. God is so much bigger than us that he, he doesn't have to operate in the ways and on the levels that we think God should operate. He's not on our level. He's greater than us. And so we can't fully fathom everything he does. But the second thing that I, that I want to tell you today, and I really want to encourage you, if you're there and you just can't get past it and you just struggle and you're just uncertain, just be honest. And just let God know. Spoiler alert, he already knows. So just say, God, help me. And as Gabriel reflects the heart of God here going to Mary and helping her beyond her issues, helping her see things that she can't fully understand, working with her to move her beyond her fear and her hesitancy, God is able and ready and willing to walk with you through your fear, through your hesitancy, and through your doubt. Invite him in. You don't have to run. And you don't have to be scared. And Gabriel continues, And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him to the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. He will be the fulfillment to thousands of years of prophecy. He will be the fulfillment of the one that people have waited for. And he is going to establish a kingdom that is greater than anything that you could ever fathom. He is going to establish a kingdom that is greater than this world. He is going to establish a kingdom of which there will be no end. This is the work and the purpose of Jesus. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be? Since I am a virgin. It makes no sense. I'm a virgin. I'm not going to have a kid. You're, you're telling me all these things. You're, you're telling me all, all these great things that this, this child's going to do. But I'm a virgin. You might have somebody else in mind, Gabriel. I'm not it. It's not me. And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Gabriel's like, Mary, God has a plan. God has a plan. Here's Jesus, who's fully divine, the full divinity of God in the full demonstration of humanity on display. He is fully God and fully man. This is the plan of the Savior who came because I can't pay the price for my own mistakes because the standard of God is perfection and I fall short. I don't measure up. I'm not enough. So God, because he loves me and because he still desires a relationship with me in spite of the fact that I'm not perfect because God is perfect, still loves me anyway with all of my baggage, with all of my mistakes, with all of my shortcomings, with everything that I have done that I regret, with the hurt that I have caused myself, the harm I have done to me, and the hurt and harm that I have done to other people because of my selfishness, because I was only looking out 
out for me because just for a minute I didn't care and I just hurt them and the harm that I have caused them. All of that has been forgiven because it was placed on Jesus, the one who came. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. I just have a question that I want to ask you this morning. If God stopped working in your life, would anyone notice? If God stopped working in your life, would anybody even notice? See, the problem is a lot of us, we're really good. We're really good at a lot of things. We're gifted, and we have abilities, and we've worked really hard at those abilities. You know, the, the old standard rule, you do something for 10,000 hours, and, and you've mastered it. And some of us in our, in our craft have done that. And we are, we're sought after. People in our industry, they, they come and they, they search after us. People seek us out for our advice. And, and without even realizing it, we start, we start to feel pretty good about ourselves. And we start to rely on those gifts and those abilities that God has designed us for and God has given us. And certainly none of us are good at everything, but all of us are pretty good at a couple things. And once we find that niche and we, we focus on that niche, we can be cruising along and things can be going really, really, really well for a really long time. And if we're not careful, we lose our reliance upon God and we place that reliance upon ourselves and on our own abilities and what we can accomplish. And so I just want to ask you, are you living right now in a way where your reliance is completely on you? Because you can? And you can get by? Because I promise you this, if you are, you're robbing yourself from either even greater things that God wants to accomplish through you. If God stopped working in your life right now, would anyone even notice? Or have you taken over completely and relied on yourself? And Gabriel continues, And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. That is John the Baptist, God working there to change the outlook of a family because no problem is too great for God. And then Gabriel says this, for nothing will be impossible with God. For nothing will be impossible with God. It was in 1892 when William Thompson was, when William Thompson was knighted and became Lord Kelvin. At the time, he was the world's preeminent physicist. It was largely due to his persistence and ingenuity that the first telegraph cable was successfully installed under the Atlantic Ocean. Now, I'm old enough to never experience internet, but I'm not old enough to have ever used the telegraph. It was his proposal that led to an absolute temperature scale that today is referred to as the Kelvin scale. He formulated the second law of thermodynamics and invented numerous marine instruments that improved navigation and safety on the seas. He was an international celebrity because of his intellect. He lectured in America and across the world. He was widely respected and honored. When he spoke, people listened. He'd earned that cachet. So in 1895... When he said, quote, I can state flatly that heavier than air flying machines are impossible, people listened and were convinced that he was right. Given the chance to reconsider, just one year later, when he was asked to join the Aeronautical Society, he sent a reply that said, quote, I have not the smallest molecule of faith in aerial navigation, other than ballooning, or of expectation of good results from any of the trials we hear of. So you will understand that I would not care to be a member of the Aeronautical Society. It would be just seven years later that Orville and Wilbur Wright would take their home-built plane to the sandy dunes of Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, and defy the conclusion of Lord Kelvin and make history. 
what was said to be impossible. Just this week, Sir Richard Branson defied yet another limitation when he sent aircraft into space, projecting that next year he will lead manned devices into space. What just a little over 120 years ago was said to be impossible has now taken on greater heights than anyone at the time could imagine. All because of man's ingenuity. How much greater is God? How much greater is God who spoke and this world appeared? Who's looked down and seen the imperfections that we all possess and said, I still love you. I still want a relationship with you. Who has answered prayers that we thought could never be answered. Who has changed the trajectories of lives and of homes and of families. Who has worked in us and done the miraculous. Who has changed us. Who has loved us. Who has done incredible things for us. How much greater is God than us? How much greater is God than the ingenuity that we can come up with? And so you might find yourself today in a situation where you say, my time's up. I'm done. This will never change. And I know it seems like it just is never going to happen. And I know that you have a hundred obstacles that you can list. And there are a hundred reasons why things will not work. And you can just have reason after reason where you've given up. You've completely given up on hope, saying it's over, it's done, I quit Nothing can happen. And I just want to encourage you. God's not done with you. God's not done with your story. God's not scared by your doubt. God laughs at what you think is impossible. The way that God's kingdom was ushered into this world was God went to work with a virgin who was engaged and she produced a child who would save us all. That is the God that we're talking about and that is the God who wants to intervene in the story of your life right now. And so your addiction may be great, but God is great greater. Your struggle may be great, but God is greater. Your defeat may be great, but God's greater. And the message of Gabriel to Mary is the message of God to each and every one of us today. That with God, nothing's impossible. So if you've given up, if you've lost hope, if you're tired of fighting, if you're just ready to call yourself defeated, don't quit. Don't stop. Get back up. Because God can still go to work. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. You have to explain this to your fiance. You have to know that people are going to accuse you. They're going to whisper. Your fiance is going to have to raise a child who wasn't his. He's going to know that. See, God's working in incredible ways doesn't guarantee us an easy path. And yet the response of Mary is unwilling. question I have for you today is, are you? 
Are you willing to follow the path that God calls for us when it isn't easy? Are we willing to follow the path when things are really difficult? Are we willing to follow the path that God has for us when people whisper? When the accusations fly? When it costs us something and it costs us something dearly? Are we willing to rely on God and not ourselves? Understanding that when we start to rely on God, that can take us some places that we never imagined and that honestly aren't the most comfortable for us to go. Are we willing? Because if the answer is yes, it will not be easy. It will be difficult. It will cause some hardship that we will face, and it will lead us to blessings bigger than we can ever imagine. And God will accomplish more through us than we could ever accomplish, certainly on our own. But not just that. He will accomplish more through us and through our stories than we could ever fathom. But the question is, are we willing? Let me suggest the starting point for us being willing is to start with the understanding that we have to rely on him. So Lakeside, let's be willing. Let's understand that that's not going to be easy Not everybody's going to understand. And it starts with us understanding that we aren't enough. And we need to rely on him. God, I pray. I pray for the person here whose heart's broken. And I pray for the person who's given up. And I pray that you would help them see and fully understand that nothing is impossible with you. God, I pray for the person whose life's going great, who's excited. And God, I pray that they're willing. They're willing to follow you. And that, God, when you take us places that we didn't see coming, and when things are hard, you'd give us the resolve to push on. God, I pray for the person who's struggling with doubt. Let them just be honest. And I pray that you would reveal yourself to them in a whole new way. God, I pray that you would work in, through, in spite of, and around us. And you would do great things in and through us, not for us, but God, so that you would be glorified. And God, that collectively, we would see you do some great things here. God, we're asking you to work. We're asking you to help us see changed lives and see people come to follow you. God, work through us, we ask. In your son, Jesus' name we pray.